We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So as some of you know, my interests in anthropogeny originated from studies in sialic acid biology changes in human evolution. And my background as a physician led me to explore human-specific diseases. So what then am I doing here talking about death awareness and mortality? In 2005, I lectured at the University of Arizona and ventured beyond my expertise opining about the evolution of human cognition. At the lunch that followed, a local professor sat next to me and said, you are all asking the wrong question. Danny Brower's point was perhaps we should not be asking how human minds evolved. They have been highly intelligent, warm-blooded social creatures around for tens of thousands of years. Elephants, carved birds, apes, and dolphins. So why are we not having to compete with these other species? Danny suggested that it was not just that something unusual happened during human evolution, but also that all these other species were blocked in progression by a cognitive barrier that only we had broken through. So I was really intrigued by this contrarian view, and we talked a long time after everyone was gone, and I strongly recommended that he publish. Seeing nothing in print after more than a year, I followed up with emails, got no responses, looked up his phone number on the internet, only to find his obituary. Danny had died very suddenly of an unusual disease called aortic dissection. I contacted his friend Sean Carroll, who said Danny had indeed been working on some novel idea but never published. After more than two decades of exploring anthropogeny, I could see some real important potential in Danny's idea, and I just could not let it die with him. Fortunately, the editor of Nature, Philip Campbell, allowed me to write a letter about Danny's idea with some embellishments. I thought I had done my duty and could leave it to experts to follow up. But a week later, I got an email from Danny Brower's widow, Sharon, thanking me for writing the letter, told me that Danny had started a book, and asked if I would like to read it. Looking at his draft, I realized that his thinking had progressed very much in the way mine had, and we had come to very similar conclusions independently. But there were great challenges in completing this book. First, one author was dead, <laughs> and the other wanted to preserve the original intent and prose. Second, I really had no time to do full justice to it because of my lack of expertise and, and also lack of time. And last but not least, who would care about a book by a dead insect geneticist and a living physician scientist who claimed to have explained the human mind? So I sat on this for a while, but fortunately, a friend of mine, Abraham Burgess, an author, put me in touch with his agent, Mary Evans, who saw the potential in the book and convinced Carrie Goldstein at 12 Books to help me with it. And so I went on. Strike four, which I won't talk about, is Superstorm Sandy. Strike five was poor fall through on my part because of lack of expertise and lack of time. And last but not least was a book title that the publisher insisted on, which was Denial. 
So for a while I thought that this was a hackneyed old phrase that had so many meanings that it didn't really say what I wanted to say. And in fact, if you looked in Amazon, you would find not only the famous important book relative to this topic, Denial of Death, but numerous books with the word denial in them. <laughs> the more I thought about it, I realized that actually the publisher and agent were right. All these books are talking really about various versions of the same phenomenon, the human penchant for denying reality. And in fact, as you read more, I found other books by many famous authors, all of which are on different topics, but all contain pieces of the same story, our human ability to ignore reality. Let me give you some practical examples. As a physician, I'm acutely aware of the fact that lack of exercise, unhealthy diet, tobacco use, ignoring obesity, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, <laughs> poor hygiene, and excessive red meat are bad for you. But I'm not gonna show ask for a show of hands because <laughs> Physicians like myself are equally guilty. <laughs> then we have massive denial of scientific reality, biological evolution, climate change, magical cures, vaccines don't work, worse still, they cause autism despite it being debunked, UFOs of course, weird cancer risks, not the real ones, and here in San Diego, fluoride in the water is a communist plot. And then there are many examples of societal denial of practical reality. National debt, each of you owes $150,000. <laughs> Healthcare costs, end-of-life costs, covert racism, population growth, and insistence on rebuilding in exactly the places where the worst earthquakes, floods, and hurricanes have occurred. <laughs> and then, of course, the examples of political distortion of reality. I'm not going to read this slide, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but to be fair, there are plenty of examples of distortion of reality at the other end of the political spectrum. I think Calvin puts it well to Hobbes. It's not denial. I'm just very selective about the reality that I accept. <laughs> so I, uh, after writing the book, I had much difficulty finding a single word or phrase that encompasses this phenomenon. So I'm going to use a phrase I didn't find in the dictionary, reality denial, which I'm defining as some kind of subconscious defense mechanism characterized by refusal to acknowledge or rationalization of unwanted or unpleasant facts, realities, thoughts, or feelings. Now, so I think we have to add reality denial to the long list of unusual and exaggerated cognitive features of humans, some of which are listed here. But for most of these other features, we can think of good reasons why they might have evolved in terms of benefiting humans. But the reality denial, there's a mystery. Excessive reality denial of the kind that humans practice should be an evolutionary maladaptation. Excessive reality denial should result in excessive risk taking and the individuals who have the genetic ability to do that should disappear. So how and why did he, excessive reality denial and risk-taking evolve in humans? And what benefits outweighed those negative consequences? So now bring, this brings me another extension of Danny's idea that the independent evolution of self-awareness in the very same intelligent creatures that we've discussed before, although there are lots of arguments about the techniques used in the real conclusions, it's reasonably clear that chimpanzees and perhaps elephants, dolphins, and magpies can recognize themselves in a mirror and have some kind of sense of self. It's hard to define exactly what it is, but they certainly do have this. So are animals and birds with awareness of their own self also aware of the self-awareness of others of their own kind? I asked myself that question and did some reading and realized I was thinking about something that's been well studied called theory of mind. The ability to attribute mental beliefs, desires, intentions, and perspectives to oneself and to others, and to understand that others also have beliefs, desires, intentions, and perspectives that are similar or different from one's own. There are many other related terms, intentionality, etc., that I won't go through, but they're all overlapping terms. But after reading further, I realized there's a continuum in the cognitive development of theory of mind and intentionality. A two-year-old human passes the mirror test. A three- to four-year-old human has a more rudimentary theory of mind that emerges. A five-year-old human has a full theory of mind and can tell excellent lies. 
But adult humans have something that I might call extended theory of mind, of multi-order intentionality, the ability to do what we're doing right now. You're, you're reading my mind, I'm reading my, your mind, and there are 100 people or several hundred people across the world on the live internet watching and thinking of what you're thinking or perhaps something different. And with the internet, of course, we can have millions of minds melted across the world at the same time. So the question, and this is of course a continuum, the question arises, why is this extended theory of mind so well developed in adult humans and apparently not in other species? So here's my expansion of Danny's idea. I suggest that there's a, there was a psychological evolutionary barrier that held back all these other intelligent species at about this point in the evolution of theory of mind. What might that barrier be? We can now come back to the theme of the symposium and suggest there's also a continuum in the awareness of death risk and understanding of personal mortality. I may not have my numbers exactly correct, but it seems to me that uh, you first have an automated reaction to death risk, which as Joe pointed out, many species, all, all species should have, some kind of awareness of death risk. And if some kind of self-awareness was enhanced at that time, you would maybe become aware of the death of the, another individual. But if I substitute crows for magpies here, uh, it's the very same animal birds and, and birds that seem to evolve some kind of awareness of death you heard about earlier in the symposium. That seems right on the cusp of what humans have, and yet just short of it. So the operative word here is mortality salience, conscious understanding and realization of one's personal mortality. So if you go down this continuum, well, the death anxiety may require extended theory of mind. Truly understanding the death of another individual would result in understanding the mortality of other individuals. And this conscious awareness would exaggerate the systems we've heard about that extensively not just actual events, but even thinking about it at the level of consciousness, as Joe said. Such individuals would then have a re reduction in reproductive fitness. Evolution doesn't care if you survive. Evolution cares if you reproduce. And I suspect that those individuals who first ran into this barrier, and maybe it happened many times in many species, had reduction in reproductive fitness and could not transmit their genotype. So then the emergence of extended theory of mind would result in awareness of mortality and again a failure to fix the genotype in two species. We've already said that reality denial should be negative. So what if these two unusual cognitive features emerged in the same minds at the same time, a rare negative, double negative, which could result sufficient tolerance of death anxiety to establish the combination of the species? Thus, perhaps two rare evolutionary maladaptations or negatives could have coincided to allow this mind over reality transition. I have a much more extended view of this that we don't have time to discuss. <laughs> Uh, I need to talk to some experts to it before I go any further with that. Uh, but any theory that makes progress is bound to be initially counterintuitive. So I'd like to suggest that this hypothetical singular phase in human evolution, which mortality salience and maladaptive death anxiety were triggered by acquiring extended theory of mind, which resulted in understanding of personal mortality. But then, then one time only was stabilized by simultaneous acquisition of reality, general reality denial in the same minds. I remember asking Danny, there couldn't be a death denial module, but he came to the same conclusion I have. We just deny anything we don't like. <laughs> so there are other consequences, afterlife myths, superstitions, religiosity, self-deception, overconfidence, risk-taking, and last but not least, the optimism bias. Humans are well known to be irrationally optimistic. Many studies have shown this, even with fMRI studies. And evolutionary modeling <laughs> shows that reacting in an overconfident manner can have fitness benefits, as long as the contested resource is sufficiently large compared to the cost of competition. Now, if you combine overconfidence with extended theory of mind, you've got big success. Of course, here is a case, I believe, of initially successful but eventually fatal case of reality denial. So how important is reality denial? Let's do a thought experiment and delete it. Well, some other features of humans would, would get dimmed or partially eliminated. But let's now dim theory of mind and eliminate that. 
And you'd find that most of these unusual or exaggerated cognitive features of humans, while they could still be present, would be greatly dimmed. So I suggest that this combination could give you this transition, which is consistent so far with all known facts, compatible with other theories, not negated by currently known facts, but is not directly testable by experimental reproduction or directly fals falsifiable by experimental approaches. Now, the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. <laughs> and I've been searching for that fact to, to destroy this hypothesis. If you can find it, let me know. But it can't just be, I don't like it. So when did this occur in human evolution finally? We know that about two million years ago, our ancestors from Africa, some stayed behind and some spread all across the old world to give rise to Neanderthals and many other species. And this went on for almost two million years, leaving behind many species and subspecies. But the types of things that you might think might be related to theory of mind, reality denial leaves no signal in the record I can think of. But symbolic art, complex tool making, personal ornamentation, burials with added materials, all occur around 100 to 200,000 years ago. Again, I'm, the experts will be much more precise than I am. This happens to be about the time that the human migration and the peopling of the world occurred, in which our species evolved in Africa and gradually spread across the world and essentially took over the planet. And we are now, unlike most other subspecies where there are multiple species, we are the lone survivors and the masters of the planet. So while we can't be sure, I'd like to speculate that the evolution of anatomically modern humans into behaviorally modern humans, which is seen in the archeological record, although it's quite incomplete, may have at least partly involved this transition. So, uh, it so happens this theory can provide a unifying explanation for several unusual exaggerated features of humans, such as theory of mind, which is beneficial for many things, reality denial, strong tendency for self-deception and false beliefs, overarching optimism bias, risk-taking behavior, recent emergence perhaps as a dominant species, and replacement of everybody else. Remember, this would have to be a, have a genetic basis. There are some examples of supporting evidence I don't have time to talk about and issues arising in future directions I don't have time to talk about, but <laughs> I would point out that some of the brain regions involved in optimism, bias, anxiety, and so on are related to some of these, uh, act, these things. So finally, let me close by coming back to Danny Brower. From Danny Brower's 2007 draft manuscript, we are polluting the earth and changing the climate in ways that we can't predict, and likely at some point can't easily reverse. If you're so smart, why do we continue to sow the seeds for our eventual destruction? Perhaps because we are saddled with a brain that is designed by selection to cope with the ultimate disaster, death, by denying it will occur. And so we treat all of the impending disasters by denying they will never happen. Indeed, it is arguable that we are destined to destroy ourselves as a species, 2007. You don't have to listen to the climate scientists. Just look at the HSBC bank's pro projection for what they're going to run into in terms of extreme weather events. Personally, I think this is a case where legitimate fear-mongering is appropriate. It's global and local climate disruption, not just climate change, affecting you and everybody else that you know in your backyard. Again, a quote I found in Danny's manuscript. A man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can never learn in any other way. We have caught the climate tiger by the tail, and we better let go soon. Finally, from Danny's manuscript, he had a lot of cartoons I couldn't reproduce in the book for copyright reasons, but I'm just showing one of them. Doctor to Earth, the bad news is you've got advanced stage humans. The good news is they've just about run their course, and you should be on the men soon. <laughs> So with that, I'd like to close with the idea that two rare evolutionary maladaptations, this is just a theory for discussion, might have coincided to allow the mind over reality transition. Thank you. In the 1860s or so, a Scottish essayist, who I'm very fond of, Alexander Smith, uh, wrote, it is our knowledge that we have to die that makes us human. And 
couple of decades later, uh, William James in the 1890s, he called death uh, the worm at the core of the human experience. And then if we fast forward a couple of decades, almost a century after that, in the 1970s, the cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Denial of Death, uh, in which he basically elaborated on that basic idea. It is our knowledge that we have to die uh, that makes us human. And he did so by uh, trying to frame these ideas in both an evolutionary uh, as well as an existential psychodynamic fashion. And, and uh, what Becker does, even though this may sound a tad dated given some of the ideas that we've already been exposed to today, uh, is to just start with, I think, the relatively simple Darwinian assumption uh, that people are very similar to all other forms of life and that we're biologically predisposed to survive uh, both in the interest of self-preservation uh, as well as reproducing and extending our genes over time. On the other hand, Darwin noticed very early on uh, that there's lots of ways uh, over billions of years of evolution that different forms of life have accomplished that most arduous task of persisting over time. So everything from the turtle shells to the eagle's eyesight, and it raises the question of, well, what is it uh, that is responsible for our fantastic success? And, and the answer is there's lots of things, uh, both physical uh, and psychological, including our relatively large forebrain that gives us the capacity to think abstractly and symbolically to the point Becker notes that only human beings, as far as we can tell, can imagine something that doesn't yet exist and then have the audacity to take our dreams and render them into reality. Some of you have probably seen a few head shakes. I know it's late in the day. Who's seen uh, Da Vinci's drawings of helicopters in the 1500s? And when he did that, people said, wow, uh, that's crazy. And yet today we are routinely transported by what was originally denounced as the doodlings of a madman. And so uh, abstract symbolic thought uh, has certainly served us very well. And I like how Otto Rank, one of Freud's disciples, put it uh, when he said that only human beings make the unreal real. What Becker then does, though, is to move back in time a couple of decades and to think about this idea in light of the Danish existential philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. And it was Kierkegaard who pointed out uh, that human beings are so smart that we come to realize that we exist. Uh, Self-awareness, a, a complex theory of mind. The way that Kierkegaard put it, it takes a ridiculously sophisticated cognitive apparatus to render yourself the object of your own subjective inquiry. And what Kierkegaard did in a little book called Fear and Trembling that I always recommend you buy for your in-law's coffee table as a holiday gift, uh, what Kierkegaard said uh, was that there are emotional ramifications of being explicitly self-aware. And he described them uh, as being both awesome and dreadful. Kierkegaard said, you know what? It's really great to be self-aware and to be alive. Who's ever had one of those magic moments? You wake up on a beautiful day like today. Uh, you didn't win a Nobel Prize. You didn't win a great fortune. And yet you're just sublimely appreciative of the fact that you're alive. I, everybody does look pretty happy today. I grew up. <laughs> in New Jersey, so it's a little dicier. But I think for the most part, uh, we all understand just the sublime and spontaneous exuberance that comes from being alive and knowing that we're here. On the other hand, Kierkegaard turns right around and he says, yeah, uh, but it's also dreadful to be alive and to know it uh, because lest G be either a small child or neurologically impaired, if you're smart enough to know that you're here, you're also smart enough to know that like all living things, your life is of finite duration. Moreover, you're smart enough to realize uh, that your life could end at any time for reasons that you could never anticipate or control, and, and that from a purely biological perspective, you're a breathing piece of defecating meat that is no more fundamentally significant or enduring than a lizard or a potato. And what 
Becker argued is that uh, the explicit awareness of the reality of the human condition, we will all someday die, we can die at any time, we're breathing pieces of meat, cold cuts with attitudes, we're spam with a plan, but we got no can, uh, would uh, literally debilitate us with paralyzing existential terror. And what Becker proposed is that human beings manage the terror that is engendered by the awareness of their mortality uh, by embedding ourselves uh, in what the anthropologists call culture, humanly constructed beliefs about the nature of reality that we share with our fellow human beings that give us a sense that life have meaning and that we have value. And, and what Becker points out as an anthropologist is that all cultures have uh, stories or, or accounts of the origin of the universe. All cultures have prescriptions for how we ought to behave while we're here. All cultures offer hope of immortality, either literally through the heavens, souls, and afterlives of the world's great religions, or symbolically through the belief that while you may not be here and I may not be here forever, we're comforted by the prospect that some manifestation of our existence will persist over time, perhaps from having children, perhaps from amassing great fortunes, perhaps uh, from uh, producing great works of art and science. Uh, moreover, what culture does for us is to give us each social roles with associated standards of conduct that if we meet or exceed them, uh, allow us to think that we're persons of value in a world of meaning. And, and when we do think that way about ourselves, Becker called that self-esteem. His argument is that because our beliefs about the world and because self-esteem are so important that whether we're aware of it or not, uh, most of our behavior from day to day is motivated in the service of maintaining those beliefs. All right, two questions. One question is, so what? And the other question is, is any of this true? The, the so what question uh, in our world is generally framed in terms of conceptual power. Uh, what is it that you could understand if you momentarily accept the veracity of Becker's claims that might be less easy to understand otherwise? And, and then the second question is, well, is there any evidence in support of these views? What we did, and when I say we, I mean my buddies Jeff Greenberg, now at the University of Arizona, and Tom Pazinski, now at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, um, we developed a very simple laboratory paradigm. It's called the mortality salience paradigm. And, and the logic, I think, is disarmingly simple. We just said, all right, uh, if these ideas are correct, if our beliefs about reality serve to mitigate death anxiety, well, well uh, let's bring people into the lab and let's remind them that they're going to die. And in control conditions, uh, let's remind them, it's not as gory as it sounds, let's remind them in control conditions of something unpleasant but not fatal. For students, think about your next exam. Uh, for regular people, think about going to the dentist and needing a root canal without anesthesia. Think about being in a car crash and having a limb amputated, all unpleasant, but uh, not particularly fatal. Right, in our typical paradigm, uh, we bury in a bunch of personality scales two open-ended questions. Please briefly describe the emotions that the thought of your own death arouse in you and jot down as specifically as you can what you think will happen to you as you physically die. All right, we do this in a lot of ways though. Sometimes we go outside the lab and we stop people either in front of a funeral parlor or 100 meters to either side, uh, thinking that when you're in front of a funeral parlor, death may be on your mind even if you don't know it. And then the most subtle uh, paradigm, we call it subliminal death primes. If you come to my office at Skidmore, uh, you can read your email, and while you're doing that, we'll flash the word death uh, for 28 milliseconds so fast uh, that you don't know that you have been exposed to that rather unwelcome stimulus. All right, so that's what we do. All of these methods produce the same outcomes, and so let's briefly talk about some of the areas of inquiry. Uh, a lot of them Ajit mentioned earlier uh, in his fine talk. All right, so 
what do we know based on almost 40 years uh, of research? Our original interest was trying to understand why people can't get along with other people who don't share their beliefs about the nature of reality. And what Ernest Becker said in a book called Escape from Evil uh, is that other people pose an existential challenge to our belief systems because if you accept an alternative conception of reality, uh, you do so by undermining the confidence with which you sub subscribe to your own. And when you do that, you undermine the uh, beliefs that serve to minimize your anxiety. And what he proposed is that when we run into people who are different, the first thing we do is to denigrate or belittle them. While we do that, we simultaneously try to get them uh, to get rid of their ideas and adopt ours instead, and if that doesn't work, just kill those people, thus proving uh, that my God is better than your God, and we will kick your ass to prove it. Now, in support of that view, uh, what we know in uh, several hundred studies conducted all over the world by our people and independent researchers is, for example, Christians reminded of their mortality, they like fellow Christians a lot more, and they hate Jewish people. Uh, if you go to Israel and remind Jewish people of their mortality. Uh, they love Jewish people and they hate Arabs and Christians. Germans reminded of their mortality sit closer to fellow Germans and they sit further away from people who look like Turkish immigrants. Iranians reminded of their mortality become more supportive of suicide bombers and more willing to become a suicide bomber themselves. In America, as you know, we're very practical. We're not about to blow ourselves up, but we're happy to blow up other people. Uh, when we remind Americans of their mortality, they become more supportive of the preemptive use of biological, nuclear, and chemical weapons against countries who pose no direct threat to us. Uh, another area of inquiry for us that's not funny um, <laughs> it, it has been uh, understanding uh, how existential anxieties have a radical effect on political preferences. Max Weber, the German sociologist at the beginning of the 20th century, coined the term charismatic leader. He said that in times of historical upheaval when existential anxieties are apt to be aroused, that we often embrace a certain kind of seemingly larger than life leader who he called charismatic. And he said that very often these are people who believe to be either divinely ordained or self-appointed uh, in order to rid the world of evil. And we got interested in this in the aftermath of September 11th, 2001. Old timers may remember that in a three week period, President George W. Bush went from the least liked to the most liked president in American history. We did a lot of studies leading up to the 2004 election where we showed that Americans preferred Senator John Kerry to President Bush uh, in a benign state of mind. However, when they were reminded of their mortality first, they liked President Bush a whole lot more than Senator Kerry. Ditto in this election. This summer, uh, we found in several studies that our respondents preferred Secretary Clinton to now President Trump uh, when they were in a psychologically benign state of mind. However, when they were reminded of their mortality first, their affection and support for President Trump increased and they now liked him more than they did Secretary Clinton. All right, let's keep going and let's see how death anxiety uh, fosters an alienation from nature and contempt for the environment. Um, uh, John Locke in the 1890s in the second treatise on government pointed out that anything that's natural is of finite duration. And of course, that's what we chafe at and that may have been the psychological impetus for the construction of the supernatural. And, and to the extent that that's true, when death is on our mind, we should chafe at the prospect that we're animals and we should be uncomfortable in nature. And that's exactly what we find. People who are reminded of their mortality uh, take issue with claims that humans are animals. Uh, they have more negative attitudes towards animals and think it's okay to kill them for reasons other uh, than food and medical research. People reminded of their mortality become more uncomfortable uh, when they're out in nature. 
and people reminded of their mortality uh, become more willing to greedily exploit non-renewable natural resources. And of course, we can't talk about the plundering uh, of the environment without a concurrent consideration uh, of our seemingly insatiable desire uh, for money and stuff. I, I like how Big Daddy and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof put it when he said, the human animal is a beast that dies. And if he's got money, he buys and buys and buys. And I think the reason he buys everything that he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he has the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting. And research shows that Big Daddy's right on the money. People reminded of their mortality uh, say that they have higher fiscal aspirations and they say it would take more money uh, before they would perceive themselves as wealthy. People reminded of their mortality want more stuff, not just any stuff. They want high status luxury items like a Lexus uh, and a Rolex. When people are reminded of their mortality and you ask them to draw pictures of money, they draw bigger pictures as if money looms larger when death is on their mind. And, and just giving people money to count, not to keep, just counting money uh, reduces death anxiety. Uh, if you like cookies uh, and you're reminded of death, uh, you eat more cookies. If you smoke cigarettes and you're reminded of death, you smoke more cigarettes. If you drink alcohol and you're reminded of death, uh, you drink uh, more alcohol. Well, uh, so what? Um, Thomas Hardy, one of my favorite novelists, said, if a way to the better there be, uh, it comes from taking a close look at, at the worst. And, and just to follow up on some of the things that Ajit talked about at, at the end of his talk, um, I, I would argue uh, that malignant manifestations of death anxiety uh, surely do not bring out the best in us. They, they they seem to turn us into uh, hateful, warmongering, proto-fascists, plundering the planet in our insatiable quest for dollars and dross uh, in a television, alcohol, drug, Facebook, Twitter-induced stupor. And, and, and Danny Brower might be right in, in 2007 uh, when he said that, wow, uh, an ironic effect of our zeal to deny death uh, may be that we are the first form of life to have the ignominious distinction of being responsible uh, for our extinction. All right, having said that, though, let me close on a more positive note and just point out, <laughs> usually I stop now and I'm like, all right, thank you very much, uh, let's drink. Uh, on a more positive note, though, human beings, we have a good track record historically of extricating ourselves from some very difficult circumstances once we understand uh, what underlies them. Uh, in the Middle Ages, when people were dropping like flies from the plague, when we thought that it was caused by evil spirits, we really didn't get anywhere. Uh, on the other hand, when we realized that it was bacteria, then we were able to develop a, a penicillin, and, and that led to modern medicine. Similarly, what I would like to think, even if this appears naively optimistic, is that if we could collectively come to recognize uh, the incredible problems that excessive death denial uh, has produced, then maybe we can also collectively deploy our remarkable creativity and ingenuity in order to nudge our species into a more benign or maybe even more benevolent direction. I like how Camus put it, come to terms with death, thereafter anything is possible. Maybe an overstatement, but no harm in using this as a standard to approximate. Thank you very much. As so, Sajid so said, we thought we should discuss this issue of suicide at, the, at, the, at this meeting because it, it is something which has almost certainly had a major bearing on the history of our own species. I've shown the, um, a panel from a late Roman ivory casket, which is in the British Museum. Um, you'll see it shows two very different examples uh, of humans who brought death on themselves deliberately. Jesus, who had no desire to stop living, but who believed his death would benefit all mankind. And then Judas, who had no thought of benefiting others, but, uh, but assumed that by his own death would at least put an end to his, to his own intolerable guilt. Suicide used to be called self-murder, um, fellow to say. And it may seem hard to associate 
harsh, I should say, to associate um, suicide with murder. But if we're looking for the evolutionary antecedents of suicide, I think this does, in fact, get us off on the right foot. Humans have always been murderers. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, they've been killers of other living beings, I should beings. First, of course, they were killers of animal prey for food, and everybody in the community would have been involved directly in that. But they were also killers of other human beings. Not everyone would have had first-hand experience of assassination, but everyone would have known about it and talked about it um, and no, no doubt celebrated it. And then the idea dawned. Um, here's how psychiatrist Owen Stengel, Stengel has put it. At some stage of evolution, man must have discovered that he can kill not only animals and fellow men, but also himself. It can be assumed that life has never since been the same for him. But I think it wasn't so much the discovery that he, that he can kill himself that would have changed things. It was the discovery of what killing himself would have amounted to that it would have amounted to removing himself from the world. A human could choose not to be. That's why non-human animals don't and can't commit suicide. Um, at any rate, uh, even if they do kill themselves, as perhaps these whales did, we shouldn't call it suicide, though that BBC headline clearly did suggest we might. The whales can't have been choosing death because so far as we know, they haven't discovered what death means. But humans, of course, have done. Humans can choose death, knowing pretty well what it'll mean for them personally. And I think Stengel's right to say uh, that this discovery has been transformative. But we still have to ask transformative in just what ways. And if we're thinking about human evolution, the question must be, what effects, good or bad, did this discovery have on biological survival? Other kinds of killing can clearly be adaptive. It's easy to explain the survival advantages of hunting. It's not difficult to explain the advantages of war or homicide. But common sense would seem to say that self-killing must be the ultimately disadvantageous act, a sure path to genetic oblivion. Yet, uh, the stark fact is that suicide is alarmingly common right across the world. Someone in the United States kills themselves every 12 minutes. That's 120 a day. Across the world, more people die from suicide than all wars and homicides combined. We surely have to ask, then, is suicide biologically adaptive after all? Well, the answer is not going to be simple. As I implied with my first slide, I think we need to distinguish uh, two rather different kinds of suicide. And we can call them, as Durkheim did, altruistic suicide and egoistic suicide. And I want to suggest, suggest they correspond to two rather different conceptions of what death does. The first and simplest conception is that death results in the annihilation of the body. The dead person is no longer an actor in the physical or social world. And corresponding to this, when people uh, choose to bring about their own death, they may be trying to make things better for others by giving up their own bodily presence. Jesus died on the cross in the hope of becoming the savior of all mankind. Or for a more straightforward example, Captain Oates stumbled out to die in the snow in the hope of relieving the burden for the remaining members of Scott's polar exp ex expedition. Altruistic suicide, we can call that. But could this kind of suicide be adaptive. It certainly could be, provided it benefits the subject's kin or social group. In fact, it's possible that a propensity, propensity for altruistic suicide has been selected in humans in rather the same way that something like it has been selected in the social insects. So maybe humans are genetically predisposed, like ants or bees, to sacrifice themselves for the common good in times of famine or plague or war or simply when they become too old and decrepit to carry on. But now let's look at another kind of suicide, perhaps corresponding to a second conception of what death does. This is that death results in the annihilation of the mind. The dead person is no longer a thinker or a feeler. And corresponding to this conception, when people kill themselves, 
they may be trying to make things better for themselves by giving up on their own conscious presence. Judas Iscariot sought conscious oblivion because he could not live with his internal sense of shame. This young couple could not bear the pain of being forbidden by their families to marry. This is egoistic suicide, um, and it's in many ways the absolute opposite of altruistic suicide. Far from hoping to benefit others, these self-killers are motivated primarily by self-interest. They either don't care about the effect on others, or sometimes they even intend some kind of vengeance. And whether they intend it or not, the effects on family and friends are often devastating. Now, here's the problem from an evolutionary point of view. The fact is that 90% of suicides are egotistical. The World Federation for Mental Health, for example, reports that um, the most common situations of, or life events that might cause suicidal thoughts that have to do with helping other people. They're grief, sexual abuse, financial problems, remorse, rejection, relationship breakup, and unemployment. And anthropologist Charles MacDonald, having surveyed suicide across the whole world, concludes, a cross-cultural comparison shows that grief over and conflict between closely related people, together with sheer physical pain and discomfort, cause or promote suicide more often than any other circumstances. The suicide simply wants to stop hurting. What the egoistic suicide wants to achieve is basically self-euthanasia. Well, could this be adaptive? No, how could it possibly be? Most egoistic, egoistical suicides are young. Across the world, it's the most, second most common cause of death amongst teenagers. If they had not died by their own hand, this couple hadn't died by their own hand, they would almost certainly have got over the hurt and gone on to make a success of their lives. Egoistic suicides ruin not only their own biological fitness, but those of related individuals too. So what's going on? Why do these tragic deaths happen so frequently? I think the answer is all too obvious. Humans and humans alone understand that by killing themselves, they can indeed stop the hurting. So there must be circumstances when they may well look on suicide as a rational act. They feel sad or jealous or unloved or inadequate or whatever. These are feelings that death will make go away. Nothing hurts less than being dead. In Hamlet's, uh, no, sorry, uh, and what's more, as the poetry of suicide continually reminds us, this solution to the hurting may not only be rational, it must often be relatively easy. In Hamlet's notorious soliloquy, who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, when he himself might his creators make with a bare bodkin, a dagger. As Hamlet recognizes, there's an unfortunate truth about being human, probably more true of humans than any other animal, and it is that hurting is part of life. The poet Cesare Pavese said it explicitly, everyone, every human, has a good reason for suicide. The philosopher Wittgenstein once told a friend that all his life, there had hardly been a day in which he hadn't thought suicide a possibility. More typically among today's American high school students, 60% say they've considered killing themselves. 14% have thought about it seriously in the last year, and 5% have attempted it. That's more than one million students a year. Susan Sontag has written, how thin the line between the will to live and the will to die. How about a hole, she asks, a really deep hole which you put in a public place for general use. In Manhattan, say, at the corner of 70th and 5th, a sign beside the hole reads, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, suicide permitted. Just that, a sign. Why, surely people would jump who had hardly, hardly thought of it before. As I said, it's not only rational sometimes, but it's also very easy. Now, this is a Carter Symposium, and we want to understand how humans, against all the odds perhaps, have, in the end, survived and prospered. And it looks as though suicide might have been a very significant drain on the fitness of our ancestors. 
It looks as though it might have been a major downside of their growing sufficiently clever to understand their own mortality, the very sequence Angie talked about. It wouldn't have been bad because, uh, dangerous because they feared death, but because they were attracted to it. But surely natural selection then ought to have sorted this out long ago. Why haven't humans evolved to have better innate defences against suicide built into their minds? Well, of course, Ajit thinks they have. When reality becomes too much to bear, people simply deny it. But I confess, I don't see this working as he says, or at least not in these contexts. I see no evidence that humans have evolved to have any kind of natural immunity to what I've called the lure of death. To the contrary, I'm led to think that in the past, if not today, suicide might have spread like measles in an unprotected population. In fact, measles is a surprisingly alarmingly apposite analogy because the suicide meme happens to be highly infectious. It jumps from mind to mind, resulting in the well-documented phenomenon of copycat suicides. As Durkheim wrote, suicide is very contagious. There's the well-known story of the 15 patients who hung themselves in swift succession in 1772 from the same hook in the dark passage of the hospital. Um, suicide contagion has been dubbed the Werther effect after the hero of Goethe's, Goethe's novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. The Sorrows of Young Werther. In the novel, Werther kills himself after falling hopelessly in love with a married woman. Following its, pu its publication in 1774, there were literally hundreds of copycat deaths in Germany. Recent research has confirmed just how strong the effect is. Every time a celebrity suicide is given uh, exposure in a newspaper or TV, the copycats follow. It's estimated that Marilyn Monroe's death in August 1962 was responsible for 200 extra suicides within a month. After a popular South Korean actress hung herself in 2008, suicides jumped 66% that month, with young hanging victims accounting for the most of the increase. But 66%? That's nothing. There are some parts of the world today where rates of suicide are 10 times the average elsewhere, and this turns out to be largely to do with copying. Among these happy people on the island of Palavan in the Philippines, McDonald's research has documented waves of suicide spreading through small villages. The question becomes then, how prevalent was suicide amongst our ancestors, say, 50,000 years ago? I don't think any paleoanthropologist paleo has ever thought to ask. But assuming humans must by then have acquired an understanding of death, we can be quite sure there were suicides. And let's remember, times were harsh. In the icy climate of Central Europe, there would have been plenty to be unhappy about. I think we should allow the possibility that there were indeed recurrent plagues of egoistic suicide with rates topping anything we see today. Well, if this is true, if it, there were these plagues of suicide, and I think it's a genuine scientific possibility, what could and did bring it under control? Assuming humans have never evolved adequate natural immunity to suicide, the antidote, whatever it was, must have been cultural. And here I have to say the picture is complicated and not well researched. But at least some of the cultural barriers to suicide are indeed in, pl in plain view. In historical times, religious authorities have regularly issued anathemas against it. Medieval Christianity decreed that self-murderers would go to hell. Victims would not be given a decent burial, but rather be buried at the crossroads at night with a stake through the heart. In many countries, attempted suicide has also been made a crime under the common law. In the United Kingdom, attempted suicide was not decriminalised until 1961. In the 10 years pre-1961, there were 6,000 prosecutions. 5,400 attempted suicides were found guilty and imprisoned or fined. It was common practice in the 1950s in Britain to have a policeman sitting at the bedside of an unconscious patient in accident and emergency waiting to interview the patient when he or she revived. There have also been attempts to limit the spread of suicide, the suicide meme, meme by limiting exposure to it. In Europe, after the 
after the effect of Goethe's book became apparent, it was soon banned in several countries. In Germany, it was even forbidden to dress like young Werther in blue coat and yellow trousers. In most countries today, there are strict press guidelines intended to play down the reporting of suicide, to keep it off the front page and to avoid sensational headlines. So we've had suicidal acts being punished and information about them suppressed. Do these measures actually work? Well, yes, I think there's reason to think they actually probably do, or at any rate, there's no reason to think that they don't. But surely more focused methods ought to work as well. In place of punishment or censorship, why not try to fight meme with meme? Why not oppose a destructive mind virus with a redemptive one? What should we tell people who want to kill themselves? The English priest Chad Vara founded the, the, the Samaritans in 1954, a group dedicated to talking suicides down with words of reassurance. The message there is hope may seem to verge on the banal, but in fact it's the one message we can give with confidence. Research shows that in nine cases out of ten, the hurt isn't going to last. Here's Daniel Gilbert, who already uh, actually quoted, uh, author of the book, Stumbling on Her Happiness. Few of us can accurately gauge how we will feel tomorrow or next week. We expect to feel devastated if our spouse leaves us or if we get po passed over for a big promotion at work. Um, but when things like that do happen, it's soon, she never was right for me, or actually, uh, I needed me more free time for my family. People mistakenly expect such blows to be much more devastating than they turn out to be. In a sense, it's a pessimism bias, bias. We think things are going to be really bad, so bad that we can do nothing but end our lives. But the message of this research, I suppose, is don't jump now, because it's not what your future self would choose. But have we had to wait for a Harvard psychologist to tell us this? No, thankfully not. The message is implicit, perhaps for actually presumably for a good reason, in much of the hand-made-down wisdom of our old cultures, in stories and songs and proverbs and so on. And the good news for our species is that on the whole, with too many dreadful exceptions, hope can and does win out. And I think that's what basically has taken us out of the Ice Ages to where we are today. OK, um, this is the closing talk of the symposium. We've heard a lot today about what a bad thing death is. We haven't actually heard much about what a good thing life is, which is, in the end, of course, the whole point. So I'll finish with a passage from George Borrow's autobiographical novel, Le Vengre, which echoes some of the things actually Sheldon was saying. As Borrow tells it, he's been reading Goethe, and it's an autobiography, I think he had been, and he's toying with the idea of suicide. He gets into conversation with a Romany gypsy, Jasper, whom he's befriended on his travels. I read a passage from the novel. What is your opinion of death, said I, as I sat down beside him? Jasper replies that life is sweet, brother. Who would wish to die? I would wish to die, says Borrow. You talk like a fool, says Jasper. Wish to die indeed. There's night and day, brother, both sweet things. Sun, moon and stars, brother, all sweet things. There's the wind on the heath, brother. If I could only feel that, I would gladly live forever. Well, this painting is in fact called The Wind on the Heath. And I think the good news is that we've all been there. Thank you. <laughs>